All right. I am here with the man, the myth, the legend, Sujin Patel. He is the uh, managing partner at Ram Ventures. Sujin, thanks so much for joining me on this podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. Pumped to talk to you. So, Sujin, you got so much going on. I don't know how you do it. You're the co founder of Mailshake. You've acquired um, multiple companies. Do you want to maybe kick it off by just giving listeners just background on yourself and um, maybe some uh, track record of uh, Ram Ventures and Mailshake and just all yeah, the badass yeah, stuff? Sure. Doing? For sure. So, um, today, Ram Ventures has four main properties. Um, with a couple other acquisitions and companies inside of those properties. We've got Mailshake, um, Voila Norbert, Right Inbox, and ZoomShift. Um, in the past, uh, I would say like eight years, I've acquired uh, 13 businesses. I've sold, I think, five or six. I forgot the exact number now. Um, things are just moving every fast every day. Um, we've got about 75, 76 employees at the moment, um, all around the world between those four organizations, each company is run independently and a little bit, uh, how we're different than some other firms out there is that we don't have a CEO for each company. We actually, my partner and I are kind of a co-CEO or like CEO, COO, I kind of break up what we do is more of like the, I'm more of the vision and customer kind of uh, acquisition, uh, whether it be sales, marketing, customer success. And then my partner is more of the ops and finance of, of things. So think about his role is like, I want to go do all these things with the business is where I think it can go. He helps make sure it's a financially viable business and, you know, helping make sure we have all the resources needed to get there. Um, I, I, so I, like, cool. I like that a term um, that comes to mind it was a piece of advice on like the difference between like a CEO and like a COO is like the CEO looks outward and the CEO looks inward at the business mm-hmm. so it sounds like you got that, that uh, kind of kind of close yeah I think in some cases we're both the CEO and some cases we're both the CEO you know we kind of share these roles but you know, he, he and I have different brains. Like we work, we have, he's got very much an analytical financial brain. I've got a creative, you know, who cares about limitations and the numbers, the numbers will add up. I'm sure he will figure it out. Right. And it's like, how do they, how do I get these numbers to work? Um, how do I achieve whatever result? So um, it's interesting dynamic. Um, and yeah, so we've been doing this for the last, since 2015. So I would say before, you know, micro PE purchases were cool. Uh, before micro acquire existed, our life was a lot harder these days. We just kind of sit back and hang out and, and wait for your emails to kick in. Uh, currently, yeah, we, we, again, like, because we don't have a CEO, we don't just like deploy capital and go. We are the, we are operators. I like being in that seat. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a professional investor. I do some angel investing, but like, I love operating businesses. That's fun to me. Um, nice. see how the sauce is made and making the sauce is, is the fun part and so making some money a long way. You're, you're, you're an OG man. And in, in terms of, <laughs> in terms of acquisitions, I guess, um, my, my next question would be, so, uh, with Ram Ram ventures, um, do you have like a, like a perfect startup that you would want to acquire or like what sort of criteria do you look at? Is it B2B only? Is it SaaS only? Are you, is it tech, tech stack? Um, can you just give details on like, if you get an email or you come across something I might require that has like this, 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 you're like, I'm on it. Yeah. So I'd say our core focus, uh, we only buy companies that are B2B SaaS. That's like the only thing we do. And I, I don't, I, I ex- then I have an exclusion list. We don't really sell. We don't really buy companies that sell to e-commerce owners. Um, nothing against that. It's just we have carved what we are, what we know we're good at, and we we stick to that. And then then our sub requirement is really so. Ideally, in a in a perfect world, we're looking at one to two, one to five million dollar ARR companies um, that are in B two B SaaS. Everything else, we'll kind of look at the details unless they sell to e commerce. Uh, so no Shopify and no WordPress for the most part. Um, 
and, and again, like those businesses have slightly different economics and business models and valuations. And we just, we don't really play with that space. The other exception is unless they're strategic to any of our four properties and we've bought, you know, we've bought probably one or two companies at each of those, uh, each of our, our properties. Um, we typically do that. You know, we're looking at one right now. We'll actually just sign an LOI. So, you know, we're, we're, we're doing those small tuck-in acquisitions all the time where like revenue is not the most important factor. It might be a strategic feature or functionality. I like that. That's a big advantage for you because you have so many successful companies serving, I assume, like a, a similar customer being uh, sales and yeah. marketing. So you can buy products and grow through acquisition essentially. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's not, our, that's not my favorite way to grow. Like in you know, the finance guys, we call it inorganic growth. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. It's the most inorganic growth you can think of, uh, you buy your revenue. But I mean, I, I do think that actually ends up working out. We bought like a company last year, um, called warm up dot your email found a micro acquire LOI, like it had been out for like maybe six months. Didn't really have a big trail track record. And I would say from, uh, if this was not going into mail shake, that was a company that bought it. I would say it's too small. It's like not, not long enough of a, a track record, but I was like, Oh, this is something that we're building. And so it was a build versus buy decision. And so we'll buy any, we'll always buy versus build because it gives us speed. And then, you know, we can update, but anyways, we literally gave it away to, for free to Mailshake customers. And like, did we, we updated the product, but we did no marketing on the property. We just kept it as is. And we've tripled revenue from it. Right. So like, that's the best, like, that's the best. I would say uh, my favorite type of acquisitions are like the ones that one plus one equals five, right? Yeah. yeah. It's we've like got win, a good win, company. Win. Yeah, exactly. We've got a good company. The property's, you know, the company's good. If the functionality is great, we make sure there's always improvements and stuff. And then like those two companies together are just worth more than they are apart and they help feed each other. So um, yeah. Yeah, I like how you're able to add, you know, um, you know, some strategic uh, growth to the companies that you acquire just through your existing properties. That's badass. Um, I guess uh, the next thing I'd love to get just your your take on. So I'm sure you look at a ton of deals. You talk to a ton of founders in terms of selling their business. Um, if you had to give like two top tips for founders looking to sell their business within the next year or two, what do you think it'd be? Uh, number one is um, have a real ex realistic expectation of what your company is worth. Spend a lot of time to figure out what your actual company is worth um, because it will avoid a lot of wasted time. It'll avoid a lot of, um, um, emotional distress. So if you, if I think my company's worth 20 million, but, but buyers think it's worth 5 million, I'm 15 million in the hole emotionally. Like I'm just not going to get it. Right. Let's just well, say I talked well, to a bunch of buyers. Welcome to my world, man. Like we, yeah. Right. We, we have to do that a lot where, you know, you see uh, companies raising at huge valuations and, you know, with acquisitions, you're paying for, you know, current execution when investing is, you know, you're really paying for uh, future potential execution. Um, yeah. so, so totally agree with you on that. I'd say that's probably the number one reason um, a lot of companies don't sell microquare is they overprice and yeah. it just stops the conversation from because the gap is too big to close. It's too, yeah. And, and, and that's actually like, that was my first advice. And it's like, I have a one B on that, right? The one B <laughs> is, um, like, don't look for funded companies to evaluate your company. Look for private equity deals to evaluate your company. The reason funded, like funding, VC funding multiples are very different than exit multiples. They've always been different. And the second thing is on, on this particular topic is your company's not at scale when you're at micro acquire. Your company's not at scale unless you're at $10 million in revenue. I hate to break it to everybody here. That's the case. It's a fact. Um, that's just what happens. There, there is no changing that fact. So when you're sub $10 million, 
your valuation is inherently different. It doesn't follow fully the public market. It definitely doesn't follow the public markets. It doesn't follow VC valuations and it doesn't follow um, exit valuations. And I think even the companies that are raising money now, if you if they were to sell right now, if it wasn't someone strategic buying for something, that they, again, like they have a reason for it, they would not get the same valuation that they raised for. And so there's a decrease in, in valuation there. But um, the, the number two thing is um, spend a lot of time, spend a month. So when you decide to sell, take the next 30 days to get everything in order to make your company sellable. What does that mean? You have an answer for all the questions you're going to get asked. What are questions you're going to get asked? Well, I think Micro Acquire has a good guide on that. I think you, when you walk, when you, the onboarding process will help you understand that. Take your time there. Have, spend some time getting a clean PL. If you have add backs, okay, add, your, add some things back, whatever. And if your numbers don't look good, great, that's okay. Now you know what you need to fix. Most buyers are looking at, you know, trailing 12 months with the last financial year or calendar year. And so let's say you invested a lot in R&D, but you don't really need to continue investing in R&D for the business to be what it is. Well, you might want to sell like later on because that R&D right now, you're going to go back and forth between is this an ad back versus is this true cost, right? And so an ad back would be things that you would add the cost right back into the PL as, as like, it's not a cost because it's not going to be happening ongoing. So, um, um, you know, having clean books, I'd say is, is pretty, pretty easy to do, but I very, very rarely see it. So I look at about like 70 to 80 deals a month. Um, and I could tell like within two minutes, like who, who spent some time doing the right things <laughs> and who didn't. Right. And I'm not even a finance guy. <laughs> I think another benefit of that, and I, I agree with you entirely, is it, it just shows that you're committed to selling your company as well. It's like, I put time into this. I'm not just throwing it up with a crazy valuation. Um, yeah, even just like if you have a lack of, if you don't have a full P&L, even just like, you know, connecting metrics can go such a long way just to give like buyers like a, just any sort of, you know, visibility into the financial health of your company, I think is, is key. So I, I agree with you entirely on that. Um, yeah. Moving on to our, our next question. I'm, I'm really excited for this one. Um, what has been your favorite acquisition? It doesn't have to be size or um, just the one that maybe you bought and you're just like, that was awesome or it worked out really well or. Yeah, um, I think my favorite one was um, Bola Norbert. That was one of her kind of I knew ones. I I knew you were gonna say that one. It's such um, a good product. Yeah, it uh, so it was it was a it was a fun one. Lots of learning from like not that right not the areas I thought I'd get learnings from. Um, so I think when we bought it, the business was probably doing like eight to ten k in MRR. Um, and I just loved it. Cause I was like, Oh my God, there's so much marketing and sales like levers here. Like, it's just, all I have to do is like some conversion optimization and, um, some, you know, a little bit better marketing and boom, you get more money like, instantly. I think, and we almost like three X in the first like year. Um, I think, I think it was a little over three X, but like it was basic conversion rate optimization, like simple, like button size, color, like headline copy reduce you know simplifying the sign up and onboarding flow so user activation let's call it that um that was a huge factor that helped get more people through the door using it that was the biggest hurdle um and and then but the things i liked about the reason i liked it was like we learned about all like i my business partner and i got a crash course in like um the back end infrastructure of a business so like at the time we bought it, it was kind of a rocket ship. And because we like, we added, we, we optimized the flow so that more people would go in and use it. The thing on the back end was right about to break. Like it was like breaking every day. Um, and you couldn't see it. Cause like, it just like break in the back end yeah. and you would cool. see it, we'd fix it. Cool. Yeah. Quick question. What is, um, for people who don't know, what does um, Norbert do? 
Uh, I should probably say that. Yeah. Voila Norbert is an email finding tool and, and email verification. So if you've got someone's uh, name and uh, company, you can find an email address. Or if you've got email addresses, or let's say you, know, you do you have a marketing, an email marketing newsletter or anything like that, you can run your emails through there to make sure that they're still valid. You know, get rid of the like the people who signed up under a fake email or like the people who have switched jobs and the email no longer exists. Um, that can affect deliverability. Most commonly used by sales and recruiting firms, right? So you're headhunting, you've got the people you want to go after, you're just looking for the email address. Uh, that's kind of the most common use case. Um, but yeah, it was a fun, it was a fun, um, it was a fun project in hindsight, right? <laughs> Tyler yeah, said, like, holy that, crap, what do we buy? That, that's like some complex software. That's why I wanted to let, let yeah. listeners know what it what it is. I've used it. It's a great, it's a fantastic product. So anyone who needs um, help in that area, definitely check it out. Um, uh, moving on to um, uh, just the next question is, um, you know, last year was a, a pretty wild year just across the board for, you know, startups, acquisitions, um, you know, startups looking to raise capital, bootstrapping, pretty much everything tech across the board. Um, what's, what's like one trend you're, you're really excited about, um, for 2022? Um, I think just back to reality numbers and, and, uh, not necessarily just valuations, but like last year, at last year and a half has just been everything. Everyone's been soaring high and whether it's sustainable or not will be proved out this coming year or the next 12 to 18 months. It's, it's probably not. <laughs> I don't know that it, you mean it's not going to be sustainable. Well, I, I I say that in the sense of you know markets are cyclical; they go up and they go down. I think you know there's there's been a lot of I've seen a lot of acquisitions where I'm like, damn, you paid that? Whoa! Or yeah. you know startups raising, you know at a billion dollar valuation with you know ten million in revenue or something like that. I think mm-hmm. you know things. Or maybe that's a new normal. I don't know. Yeah, I think um, I have generally a little bit of a pessimistic view on that because if you look at the numbers, uh, the number of VC deals that go public or get sold to PEs and the, P, the PE valuation of them, or like the, the companies that don't make it to the top, that everyone else and they, they don't fail, they just don't they don't become the market leader that have raised at like market leader prices, they end up as a founder and operator of that business, you end up not getting a whole lot for it. And so uh, I I think the VC game is great. If you think you can win an industry, it's great if you're top three, it's bad for everyone else who doesn't become top three contender in that space, right? So uh, just because the valuations and the, and the, uh, and, and the uh, illiquidity of about the deal and then the dilution that happens to shareholders, like primarily the founders. Um, so anyways, long story short, I, I do think the market will, will normalize this year. Um, it's already had a bit of a correction. And I think when I say normalize, I think it's been pretty stable. Like, like buyers like myself have kind of, had a formula for how much we'd valuate a company for, for a while. The, but the discrepancy between where the founders think it was and then the buyers were, is very high. I think it's going to kind of go in the middle now or come back down a little bit more. That would help my life a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, I got um, just, uh, just three um, kind of quick questions I'd, I'd love to ask um, before we end this podcast. The first one, it's got to be... Um, uh dude what's your favorite car man yeah favorite car i mean favorite car i've owned or favorite car just in general both i need both uh i mean favorite car i've owned is mclaren 600 lt uh i mean just like a beast of a car it feels like you're driving a race car um what, it's the uh, orange car behind me what, what's uh top speed you got in it uh probably 190 something was like that it, on the that- track on track okay good yeah <laughs> so I guess yeah, yeah for sure I, that's how you die on the highway yeah <laughs> um yeah no i i do most I, I do most of track driving or like kind of spirited back road stuff but that's just hard to get to that speed in the road uh yeah. without you know without having impending 
guy. Uh, <laughs> um, favorite car, I think, out there. Um, favorite like driver's car. I would say a Ferrari four five eight. That's kind of something. That's not the like. It's it's like a ten year old plus car, but like just um, it's like the last last non turbo Ferrari. So nice. Uh, so you you you're naturally aspirated fan. Um, I just you know I like I like all types of cars. I'm I'm not I'm not pro or anti. I've you know like the McLaren had had was a turbo, which one turbo, but there's a, there's a little bit of lag. I think the perfect mix would be turbo electric and, um, you know, uh, oh, sorry, turbo and electric because the turbo, the, the electric portion would instantly spool the turbo. So removing the lag, I think BMWs, BMW and a few other manufacturers have kind of done a little bit of that, that I think that's the future of these before all the electric uh, before electric cars fully take over hundred percent of new car production we're going to see this turbo electric era like turbo gas engine plus turbo plus electric a small electric motor that's going to remove that's going to have like the best uh the best of all worlds that's my that's my prediction for the car world yeah uh the funniest thing i think um i've seen out of a car i recently drove a, a bmw i8 you know the one with, with the doors that go like this mm -hmm. and it has a sound it doesn't make any sound but it has like a speaker in the car yeah <laughs> like a fake engine sound <laughs> like it's like what the heck is this all, um, all bmw m cars have that it's really weird really i yeah. thought it was yeah, I was in it because uh, I just sometimes me and my buddies we go on Turo and we'll just like rent a car. Um, and that's the best it. thing for your buck. That's a, such that's such an underrated thing. Um, my well, friend just yeah. I'll throw out a tip just for uh, people like um, for me, it's been a fun way to just catch up with friends where I'll either pick them up from the airport like just because you're in a car together like so you, you got to talk to each other. Um, but yeah. we'll we'll rent cars and then we'll just go drive it somewhere and then we split the cost so you can rent a ferrari for like 300 bucks and it's 150 each um we rent like an r8 um but fastest car i've ever driven i don't know about you actually i want to know what is the fastest car you've ever driven it might be your um, mclaren and that's insane uh i drove like a formula two car oh man. Uh, formula three You're like cheating. on the track yeah no that thing is like it's like scary it's scary fast. I just like, uh, I don't, I can't describe it fully, but you're like, if, if you ever, anyone watch F1, the, the race car drivers are laying down. Yeah. They're practically laying down with their knees like bent up and they're pressing again. You can't drive a car laying down. It's just like, it's just so <laughs> weird of an experience. And so by default, everything feels like a thousand times faster and scarier. Um, and yeah. you feel everything and like, in, in a lot of different parts of your body let's put it that way like uh you're just gonna feel like your calf just like feel something anyways uh but that was a lot of fun i don't think i i don't think it's any faster than my mclaren that i had but it, it felt like it was you know it was night and day difference me and uh me and a buddy rented um an audi r8 and it was an older one it was um it, it, it kind of felt like driving around with a guy who doesn't know how to drive manual and you're in, in really jerky but, oh yeah, the old single clutch ones. Yeah. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah. Yeah. Good looking car. We just kind of got it because of probably Iron Man. Um, but we um <laughs> nice. so we stopped by the Tesla dealership and test drove um one of their cars. This is the fastest car I've ever experienced in my life. I'm I'm I like engines, I like exhaust and stuff like that. Um, but uh I don't know if you've ever test have you just driven a Tesla before? Yeah, I have a, I have a couple. Um yeah, they're really fast. The the ludic I haven't I haven't driven the newest like plaid version of it. Yeah, uh, we, we we just say in and out, and so we were like, um, <laughs> yeah, the best we, yeah first thing to do after that. Yeah, and so we find like a a straightaway to do ludicrous mode, and literally it was so fast. Like I I had to like step out of the car. I almost threw up. I was like, yeah, it's like, fast. Yeah, I was not expecting that. Well, the, the, also the part about electric cars is that they're instant like power but, yeah and so it's just like doesn't like linearly grow like a gas car i couldn't believe it i was like like completely yeah. through my head roller coaster yeah yeah it literally does feel like a roller coaster but um 
Okay. Second question. Um, who would you say, um, you know, one of your favorite entrepreneurs is? Um, I, I know it's a little cliche, but I like Musk. Um, he, he came out big this weekend. Did you see that? Yeah. It's just like, Hey, stop going. To, who cares about Mars? Help me with my problem right now. Boom. I mean, done. What's next? <laughs> he literally, they're like, Hey, um, can you help us out in Ukraine? We need uh, internet via your satellites. And he's like, done. Yeah, <laughs> like, like three hours, three hours later, all right, I ship you a bunch of hardware. You know, it's, it's it'll get there. Um, yeah, yeah, it was just he, cool. He's a badass. All right, final question. Um, uh, maybe best book you've read um, in the last year? Um, but I'll give you, I don't, I don't know. I've read too many books in the last 12 it months. Be, it could be I like took, your, just favorite so, book in general works too. Good book for micro car customers. Built to sell. Life, like great, great book. Uh, Bo something I forgot, but I think, um, I, I think uh, John Willows wrote that. Okay, I, 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 you I, know I, what? I might be thinking of Finish Big. That's probably what I'm looking thinking about. Finish Big. Um, Bo something. Here, I'm gonna pull it up. But it's a great book um, on on really just uh, on, um, on, on building a business that you can sell and how to like examples and stories of others who've done it and, and what they, you know, yeah, John, you're right. Built to sell is different. I, I meant finish big by Bo, Bo Burlingham. And that book is just all about like examples of other companies selling their businesses. And like, it's not just like the financial gain about the emotional thing. Like I, I had a friend recently sell her company about two years ago, $50 million. And you're like, Oh my God, that's crazy. That's awesome. What do you do next? Exactly. That was the problem. Like what, how do you feel one? How do you do it bigger next time? And two, what do you actually do next? Like for the next five years and the emotional, like the emotions around what you do next are a lot. And so like preparing yourself for that. And it's the, an, the answer is not just sit on the beach forever. Right. Cause as entrepreneurs, you can only do that for so long. Yeah. I actually, you know, kind of went through something like that when I sold um, uh, my first company um, business apps, cause my uh, transition was 90 days. And then, then I was out, like I was not needed email. Nice. And then I'm playing Madden all day um and uh it, it yeah it's one of those things where you, you got to go through it to understand it but then you learn more about yourself because you just realize like i just like building and then you go back to building so yeah yeah having a plan in place like what do you like have you thought about what you're gonna do next because yeah the beach thing kind of gets old um at least for me um but this has been great susan i really appreciate your time and just you sharing all this. If people, um, you know, have a business, they want to get a hold of you. Maybe they think it's a fit. Um, what's the best uh, way to get a hold of you? Yeah, um, best place is my website, susanpatel.com, and I kind of share a lot of helpful articles. Um, so if you're hiring or like growing your business too, um, there's a bunch of stuff on like just how to hire folks and, and scale up. Right on. Well, Susan, you're a badass. Appreciate your time and. Um, I uh, really enjoyed this podcast, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been fun. All right, cheers. Yeah.